Hello, I'm Barney Garud. I'm CEO and founder of Aerosense Limited. And today I'm gonna to show you how easy it is to use our Excel tool to an analyze your aerodynamic data. First step is to install it. And to do that, in a browser, I'm gonna to go to info.aerosense.tech and scroll down to um, downloads. And here you'll see the Excel tools. We update this quite often, so it's worth checking back for the latest version. Click on download here and it's going to download that zip file. Now it's important to note that this is in a zip file. You cannot run it from here, it won't work. So what I need to do is take this folder and extract it to somewhere that I can easily access. So I'm going to go in here. Um, I've created an, on my D drive an Aerosense folder and I'll drag that across there. Now. If I look at what's in this folder, I've got three files. I've got the Excel tool itself. That's just a normal macro enabled workbook. I've got this Aerosensor scripts file. That's just for um, Apple Mac. And I've got this fit CSV tool.jar. It's very important that wherever you save the Excel, you also have this .jar file in the same folder as we're gonna use that to decode our fit files. The only other prerequisite we, we need is to install Java. Um, you might have it already installed. It's worth um, either checking you've got it installed or just install the latest version. Just go to java.com and you download it immediately from there. I think it detects your operating system, so it should be pretty straightforward. So once we've done that, I can go ahead and open this Excel file. And it's going to bring this up. It's going to say protected view. I'm going to enable editing here. And then also it's going to block macros from running because the source of the file is untrusted. This is because you've downloaded it from the internet. Um, Apple Mac's got a slightly different way of handling this, but it'll bring up um, some warnings that will guide you through the process. So to get through this problem here, I'm going to go File, Options, and then Trust Center down here. Trust Center settings, and basically I'm just telling Excel that this is a trusted location. It's okay to open these files from here. So I click on Trusted Locations, add new location, browse, and now I can just browse to the folder I've generated there. So my D drive, error sensor. I can select the root directory here. I don't need to select error sensor analysis because there's an option for subfolders of this location also trusted. Okay. Slightly annoyingly, I have to close this and reopen, and we should be pretty much good to go. So all you're gonna see is two worksheets here, instructions and control. Instructions has all the instructions for how to set up and how to use the workbook, both on Windows and Mac. And then the main sheet we're gonna be worrying about is the control sheet. Final thing to do before we actually start loading in some data is to click on this check system um, button and that's just a useful utility to check that everything's set up correctly. So this is going to say the platform is Windows, Java is installed, I've got a nice tick there, and fitcsvtool.jar is in the correct location, got a tick there. If at this point any error messages come up or you get a red cross in these boxes, then you've done something wrong, you need to backtrack, um, go through the instructions again and make sure you've um, done everything correctly. The main issues are normally either that the files are stored, um, say, on in the cloud, say, a OneDrive folder often doesn't work because Windows struggles to find the um, some of the files it needs, or Java is not installed, or that fit CSV tool is in the wrong place. There are a few settings on this control page that we need to have a quick talk about. The first is valid speed tolerance, so where I've got a number of laps, it's gonna look at the maximum average speed of all the laps and any other laps that are within 20% of that, it's gonna mark as valid. Obviously your speed up and slow down laps, we don't wanna include in our error analysis. Track testing type, I'm gonna start off with track here, but the alternative is out and back. Delete raw data, if I select that's no, then it's gonna leave the um, a few tabs open here with the raw fit file data. That can be useful for debugging if something doesn't look right. Auto calibrate, I'll leave that as yes, because um, I want it to get the calibration factor, the error calibration factor from my data and apply it. And then speed units, we've got kilometers per hour, miles an hour, or meters per second, miles per hour. 
I'll leave this at kilometers per hour here. Um, advanced settings, let's leave that for now. What I'm gonna do is load my first file just to make sure that everything's working correctly. So here I've got a very simple test. I've got a baseline, two options, and then the final baseline repeat. It's always worth repeating your baseline at the end of your session to make sure there's been no drift, um, which could invalidate your results. So I'll click on this first FIT file, click on open. It takes a few seconds to decode the FIT file data and then load it in. So what it's gonna present me with is a summary page. So I'll have one row per um, run here. I've got the use parameters. These are the parameters that um, it's using for my calculation. By default, it's just gonna pick up the parameters that you set through the Garmin that are saved in the FIT file. And then here's my session data. I've then got a chart. This is gonna show one point for each run and then my run data here. So just taking you through this, we've got the file name, track type, auto calibration sets, true speed units, kilometers per hour, details. You can add a comment in here. So I'll just write in here anything I want really. Baseline, first baseline. Here are some um, the settings in the fit file. So that, those are the ones that you were used by the device to calculate CDA. Here are the ones used for the calibration. So I can change these if I want to. Um, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. And then this is the average data for the run and then all of my lap data. Now, if I look through my laps, one row for each lap here, um, there's gonna be a couple of outliers normally. So this 0.493, obviously that's terrible. Why is that? Well, the rider right at the end of the run has lifted up to slow down. They've come off the power. Clearly, I don't want to include that one. If I look through these numbers here, they're about 0.231 to 0.238. This 0.248 is clearly an outlier. This quite often happens at the end of a run where the rider's um, slowing down um, or coming off the power. It's not always clear exactly why that's happened. Um, certainly not obvious to me right now, but I can see that it's a clear outlier. So I'm gonna remove that as a valid. So I'm just leaving these X's in here to show the valid laps that I want to include in the calculation. I can then go back to my control page and click recalculate and that's only use these laps now now what it's doing is it's um, going to take the average calibration factor for these laps and the average CDA and then combine those to give me my CDA final the CDA final is always with that calibration factor um, included and my final calibration factor is 1.539 so we can see that we put a value of 1.35 into the device, but actually that 1.539 is what we should be using. The CDA variation is plus or minus 0 0.003. That's a variation of about one and a half percent from lap to lap. That's sort of pretty standard to be honest. Um, head and chest average positions, average your average absolute your, and then there's your standard deviation. It's not uncommon to see a couple of, well, maybe three or four degrees of your angle. And that's really because the device might not have been perfectly straight on the bike. That doesn't make any difference to the calculated drag numbers though. So I'm all good there. I'm gonna go ahead and load the rest of my FIT files. So I can select all of them together and open. It's gonna take a bit longer this time. And what it's doing here, it's creating a separate tab for each run so I've got run one, two, three, and four. And I need to do the same thing again now, just go through and make sure that the laps I've used are valid. You can see obviously here it's used one lap for that, so that's not gonna be any good. Let's have a look why, why that is. Quite often the speed of the first lap won't be appropriate. Um, that's basically because of the time and distance disconnect um, right at the start of the run. Because we ignore that anyway, it's not something we've ever connected, we've, we've ever corrected. So I'm gonna delete that as a valid lap. And then if I look down again, my CDA values, or even my speeds actually, average speed here, I'm coming up really between these runs here. So let's put my X in there. Again, looking through these, actually they're all pretty much of a muchness. So I'm happy with that. Same for run three, that's done a better job of picking out my optimal runs. Um, 
that 0.221 at the end is a clear outlier, so I'll remove that. Run for what have I got there? Um, 0.214. I might even say actually that's I'm not really happy with that. It's a bit outside the limits. That one definitely is. So once I've done that, I can go back to my control page. and recalculate. And now that's what we have for our data. So we can see we've got our first baseline here and our last baseline actually extremely close. So we've got 0.206 on that first run, 0.207 on the last run. And then my option one, which is a little bit better, you could say on a lap by lap basis. So these vertical lines here are error bars. So that shows the variation in CDA um, lap by lap and that point in the middle is the average of all of them if I just did one lap on each of these These bars overlap so I wouldn't be able to really tell whether this is better or not But because I've done my end of run baseline, and that's a really good repeat. I can have a bit of faith that this is actually better By about what 2% this one here 0 0.189 versus 0 0.206. That's gosh a good five or six percent better so we know that is a really good configuration. So the next thing I'm going to do is show you how to correct one of the parameters of your run. By parameter I mean things like wheel circumference, mass, rolling resistance, etc. So as an example what I'm going to do is take run one, copy it over and call it say run 1.2 and if I go in here and say well, I'm not very happy with my wheel circumference. Actually, it should have been 2105. There uh, might be that you forgot to set it at the track or you measured it afterwards and found it was different to what you thought it was. Um, whatever the reason, you can change it after the fact. So I can change that to, to 2105. Back to my control page here and recalculate. And we're going to find that this is my run 1.2 here. So it's sort of appended to the end of my summary. Um, Again, I should make sure oh yes, the valids will be unchanged because I just copied it over. And now I've got CDA final of 0 0.201 compared to 0 0.206. Now to give us a bit more granularity in the calculation, it's going to show me um, the corrected calibration factor. Because the calibration factor is calculated comparing your wind speed to your road speed, if your wheel circumference changes, your road speed cal uh, calculation changes and therefore your calibration factor changes. So we've got a corrected calibration factor, a corrected CDA of course and then final CDA. So corrected CDA here is just correcting for that different parameter that I changed and then CAD CDA final is applying the average corrected calibration factor to my corrected CDA and then the average of all those numbers is going to appear up here in my CDA final. So that's my final number and that's my final calibration factor. So finally I'm going to show you how to open some out and back data. Firstly in the test type I'm going to make sure this is set to out and back and then I'm going to reset my workbook. We normally suggest that you save a clean version of the AeroSensor Analysis tool somewhere that you can just copy over to your the folder where your tests are. But in case you need to reuse an old one, you can just click on Reset Workbook here. It's going to make sure that you're sure you want to delete everything in this workbook as you could lose some of your work. It's going to make really sure there. And then it's going to reset it right to the beginning. So now with this set as out and back, I'm going to go to my load fit files. And here I've got some out and back data. Again, very similar format to before. Start with a baseline, two options, and a final baseline repeat. Open them going to take a couple of seconds. So what I'm presented with here is very similar to what we had before. Um, the summary, the chart runs one, two, three, and four. Again, I'm going to go through and make sure that data is all reasonable. So because these are out and backs, every other out lap should be a turnaround. So that's exactly what I've got here. Um, I'm going to make sure I've only got the laps chosen I want to be valid. What it's doing with the out and back summary here is it's um, averaging each out and back pair. So I've got out lap one, back lap three. So one and three here. So that looks pretty good to me. Five and seven, nine, eleven. So we've got the CDA for each run, the calibration factor, 
Um, so that all looks good to me. The way the calculation goes is very similar to what we had before. Um, you can change the mass calibration factor, wheel circumference, power meter scaling and CRR. All the same as you had for velodrome testing. It's just doing this averaging of the out and back laps. So that looks good. I can go through each one of these runs here and make sure um, I've got no significant outliers. You are going to get more variation between each CDA on the out and back. And you can see here that the calibration factor going out is less than coming back, out, back, out, back. And that's because you've always got a bit of wind. So you're going to have a bit more headwind going in one direction and a bit of tailwind going the other. But averaging these values out, it should come to a pretty similar value. Um, we'll see here, yeah, calibration factor 0 0.10, 0 0.99, 0 0.99. Bit more variation because we're out in the, in the real world here. So run three, that looks pretty good to me. Run four, so that's it really. So let's have a look at the summary. Summary, um, we've got baseline, option, option, baseline. We have got a bit of baseline drift here. So we've gone from 0.344 to 0.327. So that's a variation of um, about 3%. A um, little bit more than I'd expect. We normally say you can get about plus or minus 1.5%, so we are right on the limit of that. Um, however, going through these values, you can see that that first option, 0.329, it's less than that 0.344, but it's actually greater than that last baseline. So there's a bit of a question mark over this value. I might want to repeat that again. Quite often we see that when you go out um, for the first time, the um, power meter is coming up to temperature, so you can get a little bit more variation on that first run. If that's something you see happening quite a lot, it might be worth doing a couple of baseline repeats right at the start of your test to make sure you've got stability. Um, we can see this on the chart here. So we've got a first baseline, option one, option two, last baseline. Um, quite often what I will do is just have a little um, draw a little line here between my first and my last baseline. So if you were to assume that the drift in your power meter was linear, then you could say, well, actually, this one is looking pretty good. It is below my line here. We just don't know whether this variation was linear or not. This option here, though, is clearly better. That's a definite um, win. And that's kind of over 10% um, there. So that's a smashing result. So that's it. And this is why it's so important to do your last baseline repeat. If we hadn't done that, then we would think, gosh, that's definitely a gain. But actually, we're not so clear. We'd want to be pretty careful to repeat that result before we take it um, and assume that it's better than the baseline. Right, that's everything. If you've got any questions, email us at support at aerosense.tech. We normally aim to get back to you within 24 hours. There's also our Discord forum. You can ask questions on that. When you first bought Aerosense, you would have had a link to it. Do leave a message below. Let us know what you think of these tutorial videos and um, let us know how you get on. Thank you.